Hey, Matt. Uh, welcome. We are uh, excited to talk to you. Red Paw Packs, or, or the mind behind Red Paw Packs here today on one of our Maker Spotlights. Thanks so much for joining us. Of course. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, and I'm glad you guys wanted to get me involved in the Maker Spotlight. I mean, what a great little addition to your social media content. You bet. Yeah. I mean, we obviously we sell out our products, but ultimately the people that that keep us afloat and that we really gravitate towards are the makers yourselves. So to to boost you guys up just makes our day even better. So we're happy to dive in and learn a little bit more about you and, and what you got going on. All right. Sounds good to me. So it's a basic first question, but ultimately sewing, not not super popular. Why did you get a sewing machine? Why did you start sewing your gear? Uh, what made you decide to get into this almost archaic craft of, of working with the uh, uh, thread needle? I think archaic is right. And I'd say it's almost impossible to find uh, young men in particular who do sewing. Um, so I think you're right. And that that's very few and far between. Um, what got me started was I didn't discover backpacking until college. Um, and in college, my sophomore year, I went through a program at, at FSU, Florida State, where I went to school. And basically they guide you out on trips. Um, so I went on my first backpacking trip on the approach trail on the AT. And this is the opposite of everyone else's story, but I packed too light. I was too broke to have gear. I didn't have a sleeping bag. I was in a hammock. It was winter, by the way, it was very cold. Oh, so like no. After that first trip, I was like, shoot, like I need some equipment, but I'm not going to go spend some money if I don't really know what I need or want. So um, yeah, so I just kind of got into the realm of research on reddit and really that's where it started for me is like ultralight subreddit it's like okay well this is interesting i can figure out what i actually need to take this time great and then next i was like huh myog i wonder what that is so my first realm of sewing like my first instance overall was actually through ripstop so the only the first fabric that i ordered was fabric scraps from you guys my first sewing machine was just a little amazon special whatever you know piece of junk and um, so, yeah, my first couple inspirations were, I was like, okay, I want to design a backpack. And that became the first project. Um, it wasn't the first thing I did. Like I said, I got those scraps from you guys. So I have one of my first couple stuff sacks. I think it's yes. aerobic, uh, maybe 400D, 400D aerobic. Um, this thing is, this thing is beat up, but this is one of my first stuff sacks. It's destroyed sewing. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what was going on, but it was like a test the machine, try to figure it out kind of project. Um, so yeah, I honestly, I had the intention of designing a backpack or like at least one backpack. Um, and that's the reason I started sewing. Um, and yeah, it was incredibly uncommon. Like, I don't know any other people that are 23 and know how to sew. Right. So it's like, um, it definitely seemed like a odd thing to pick up, maybe the grandma skill to pick up even. Um, but I like it. You know, I, I like that literally you create something for nothing. And I was hooked pretty quick just on that premise alone. Not even like, cause my first 10 projects were crap. Like I, you know, my, I had my first bag and stuff behind me and, and anyway, it's just, they were, they were usable for sure. Um, and that's the thing is you make that first item. And you flip it inside out. You're like, oh man, I made that. Sweet, I'm gonna go use it. And I have a bunch, um, even the really, really early stuff. So that's that's what got me excited to sew. It was literally wanting to make a backpack, um, and then that was the first proper project too. Love that feeling of when you make your first thing, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is probably the coolest thing that's ever been made. But you look back at that, you don't like, you don't think about it too much then. And then like a year later, you're like, oh my gosh, that was terrible. That is the worst looking thing I've ever seen. But in the moment, it yep. did not matter. <laughs> oh yeah, well it doesn't because you know if you're making this sack with straps, like as long as it doesn't fall apart when you put it on your shoulders, like that's great. Like that's a huge win. So you take those wins where you can get them with sewing because it's not easy to have something usable in the first place. And then it's not easy to have something that looks good too. So, you know, my first bag is so freaking ugly. Like I didn't know any techniques, like literally none. Um, and so I had to teach myself through YouTube. Like literally I'm in my college apartment with my three buddies sitting at our kitchen table. And um, yeah, I'm just sitting there like screaming at this machine, drinking a beer. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like, I can't, you know, I can't figure out what's wrong because I didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know how to, uh, what's the right word? I didn't know how to diagnose the problem. 
because that's what sewing is 100% of the time is just diagnosing a problem yeah, and then yeah. trying to troubleshoot and fix the problem. Mm -hmm. No, I think uh, that's a great description on just your sewing experience in general and how it's gone for you. But you said a couple of things um, that I thought were pretty thought provoking. Um, our demographic specifically for Rips Up by the Roll is pretty heavy male, like 75% men and 22 to 25% women. Do you think that's surprising that maybe typically, and I hate to say this, that sewing is a, a old school women's job and now like the makers community and the MYOG community and all of our makers, like it's pretty male dominated. Is that also surprising to you? Um, it is surprising, but I did know that it was male dominated, just not from your demographics, just based on the people I interact with. Um, and it's almost like, um, a new school of thought with MYOG as opposed to being a seamster or seamstress and sewing. Mm -hmm. So like, um, you know, like my grandmother, for example, who was deceased before I was born was actually a seamstress. She had yeah. one of those classic 19, I think it's 1901, the old classic black singers um, that like literally are nuclear fallout proof, like cast <laughs> iron kind of thing. Um, so it's like, that was my thought was like, okay, that's, the demographic of people who's sewing. So I think when it comes to making gear, I think it became a little more manly along the lines just because people, the guys are out there like, you know, like this isn't a typical skill. In fact, it's atypical for men, but I get to have a cool outdoors experience with the equipment that I make from it. So that, that's what motivated me. So I could understand why men would gravitate to this hobby. No, I think uh, what you said definitely makes sense. It's something that as like a, one of very few females at our company um, that I've thought about and just, you know, reading statistics and that, that I, people are on Reddit and it is, it's pretty like white male dominated. So that's something that I think, you know, we want to like learn more about and break in to other areas and introduce other people um, to the making your own gear community. Uh, is there a favorite fabric you like working with? Well, you know, you know, that's a tough question. I, the problem is I nerd out about the fabrics, like to the point where I stay up all night thinking about what's going in my next project. Um, so I have to say Dyneema five ounce hybrid. Um, that's one of my favorites of all time, just because I really love the texture of the fabric, how it crinkles. Heck, I even like how when it freezes, when you leave your bag out overnight, it turns into the like stiff like when you roll the top it's like <laughs> like kind of crunches <laughs> and hey like that's a weird quirk of that material but that's what I like about it is that it's quirky it's different um I like that it folds up and kind of wrinkles over time and almost shrinks a little bit I like all those weird aspects of Dyneema um that said I just tried out VX21 Saray finish um a couple other small companies are using this stuff um that is a very cool fabric it has a different finishing on the outer like outer you know layer um and it basically results in like a weird shiny but also matte black finish so it looks like waxed denim um, that's the only way i can describe it so there's a couple i'm always looking for the next latest and greatest and you guys of course are uh, the people who do that so you know if i had seen it in person or used it i would say your um forgot the weight of it. You have a new Venom fabric that fully woven. I think that stuff is really promising. Yeah, the 3.9. That stuff is pricey. Uh, so I'm like hesitant to make stuff <laughs> myself because I've got, you know, 25 backpacks in the other room. So I'm like hesitant to make a new one for myself with the fancy material, but hopefully a customer requests it and I get to uh, experiment with it. And even if not like the whole backpack, I think uh, one thing that we were all thinking about here is even just like the bottom half of the backpack, we're constantly setting it down on the ground, on rocks. It's, that's the place where it's most used and abused is that like that lower half. So I definitely think there, there's going to be cool ways and we'll see people coming out with some interesting things. And I'm sure you'll be making something with it soon. So it'll be I cool hope to so. see what you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope, I hope it's printable, although I'm, I'm not sure about that since it's the fully woven Dyneema. Um, but I'd love to do like a coloring book bag with that or, you know, space print, Lagoon Nebula, whatever it is. You know, I'm, I'm stoked on Outdoor Ink. Um, that's one of my favorite fabrics to work with is when you guys print them up and 
everyone, every bag, every project is super different. That's like, that excites me. Um, it's a little spooky cause you know, you, you <laughs> trace out your patterns onto this single sheet of fabric and you're like, okay, I better not mess up. Yeah. <laughs> you mess up in any part of that process. It's an expensive mistake. So, but that kind of adds a little bit of fun for me nowadays. So Avery, it's funny you mentioned that, how much you love, um, the outdooring stuff because Avery has a particularly interesting tidbit about one of your packs that you might appreciate. Oh right? yeah. So it's just like, I mean, your name honestly comes up like anytime we're talking about like a cottage company, I don't know why, but we're just like, yeah, red pop packs. And it's like the first thing that we're like relating things to. So you're like one of our pillars. I mean, there's a few other people that we're constantly talking about here, um, at Ripstop, but the pack, the orange pack, the orange Topo Dyneema that you posted recently and we reposted, that is our number, it's actually our number two most reached image. So I think over 12,000 people have seen that. And I was like, I mean, every time we post one of your stuff, it's, it's like the most likes, the most engagement, like the most people see it. So what you're doing is it's super cool. Um, and people are just like really responding to it. So you got something good going on. <laughs> it's working. Holy smokes. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's crazy. I didn't yeah. expect that honestly, but that, I think, I think what might contribute to that is like, because I'm this one man in a basement, like I'm allowed to do wacky <laughs> stuff, you know, like I'm allowed to experiment and like make that orange bag and like either make a new pattern for that, for example. But like, the customer who got that, John's like, he got his second bag. His first one was also a Topo bag, but it was in the V21 RS from you guys. Um, and so he's like, yeah, this time I want to go a little brighter, you know, and I was really excited for that. So it's like, okay, I'll do the patterning for you. I'll put the extra couple hours in. Um, so yeah, that was a really exciting bag for me too. Yeah. And you, you use a lot of the outdoor ink, but I think one thing that you do specifically that is slightly different than other people using outdoor ink is you seem to have a really good grasp on, um, sizing like making the pattern larger like blowing it up a little bit more like that topo is blown up typical atypical than what it would normally be printed at so i think you have a cool vision of like seeing the pattern and then also like zooming in on that and it turning into something really cool i don't know if you have any like topo designs nearby or anything that you want to show off that you've been working on but we'd definitely love to see oh i can show you <laughs> some stuff my shop is an absolute mess i had you know the whole christmas uh, incident here, but I've got a um, bunch of rolls of stuff here. I got coloring book and I just picked up like, unfortunately Whoa. not from you guys. I had to go to dimension polyant for this because I, I got um, six different colors of X packs. So I'll be adding that to the shop too. Nice. Um, that green woven fabric is really great. Is that great. the five two Dyneema? Yeah. Oh. I, it's a little, it's a little odd using it. It's, it's kind of different than most stuff I'm familiar with. Um, it's hard to flip inside out for one thing. Like it's, it's like leather, like it's so thick. Um, but it's a very cool material. Um, I don't know if I have anything else super exciting, but I will say the Dyneema woven melange for me guys is another favorite of mine. Um, nobody's using it for some reason and they're fools because Dyneema woven melange is one of the coolest fabrics that you guys have developed, but that I've used period. Um, the cut resistance makes it almost impossible to, for me to cut out from the roll for stuff. And when that happens, I'm impressed because it's like, okay, well, I know it's not going to be ruined on this guy's bag. It's going to actually hold up because it's a pain in the butt for me to cut it. So, uh, yeah, I've been, I've been impressed with that. One of the few areas where Carter and I like have an initial agreement <laughs> that the melange is just one of the best. <laughs> Yeah. I know when you said yeah. that, I was like, you're speaking Jameson's love language. That's like, <laughs> other than his wife, <laughs> that's number two. I'm talking about you like. Have you have two of my favorites, the melange <laughs> and the 5-2 woven. Like that green is just, it makes me want to throw up. And I also really like it. I don't really know what it yeah. is, but I've never. That's felt why I like it. About it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what are um, some cool tools that you use? You mentioned cutting. Um, and that it's hard to cut, but like, do you have favorite go-to go-to tools that you're using in your everyday creative process? You know, that that's like asking me what my favorite fabric is, what my favorite tool is, because <laughs> I'm like a lunatic where I collect tools. Like I've got four or five pairs of shears. Some are cheap, some are expensive. Um, but generally, like I just rotate, if that makes sense. Like I have a favorite pair of scissors right now, which I've lost, of course. 
Uh, here it is. <laughs> but like, for example, my shears that I use most often are these Fiskars cheap shears. Like, I've sharpened them so much. These used to be serrated. These are not serrated anymore. I've sharpened them that, that much and used them that much. But that, those are 15 bucks, for example. So it's like a proof of concept that you don't need the most expensive stuff. Like, I'm not cutting all my fabrics on a laser cutter. Like, I have access to a laser cutter at a makerspace local to me. I don't use it. It's a pain in the butt. I'm, I'm like old school. Like, and here's another thing, patterning. Um, I do paper patterns most of the time. Like people are like, what are you talking about? You do paper patterns. It's like, yeah, like I'm not going on Adobe Illustrator every time I want to make a single piece of a, of a pack. Like maybe sometimes, but you know, only when I have to like laser cut huge <laughs> templates. What is it? So what about thread snips? Like uh, Carter oh. and I were talking two nights ago, he bought like four pairs of thread snips because he was determined to find the best pair. So what do you use? Uh, let's see, I've got a handful around me. The best one, <laughs> again, the best one again is Fiskars. Um, and they're all, listen, all thread snips are crap. I think that actually is a market that I don't know exactly what needs to be fixed, but thread snips are total crap. Uh, these are the best ones just because they have a spring motion. You also can close them. Um, so Yay. you're not poking yourself. So that, that is one thing. Um, but otherwise thread also, snips are hard to sharpen. They suck. That makes sense. I know one time on Instagram on your story, you posted about uh, your lighter. <laughs> oh yeah. I've got a couple. Well, <laughs> you know, because again, because it's like everyone is, some people like these huge companies can use laser cutting and you guys do some laser cutting as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't necessarily have the means to do that because it's like, okay, I'm working on one guy's bag at one time. Like I can't go back and forth to the laser cutter to cut a specific thing. So I go manual, I go analog for a lot of the stuff. I use a jet lighter for a lot <laughs> of stuff like this. Like seriously, I will just turn on the torch and melt webbing with that. Like I have a hot knife. I don't use that. It's a pain in the butt to have a hot knife. Like if you have a whole setup and a whole table, that's not going to melt when you use it. That's great. But so like I stick with analog basic things that my dumb brain can understand, including this propane torch. Uh, you got to um, go regular lighters fine too, but you got to go real analog. My lighter ran out a couple nights ago. So I just pulled out matches and I went through like 12 <laughs> matches to burn the ends. <laughs> See at that point, go for a candle. I've seen that recommended before. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would not that, recommend. That stay there. We'll never do matches again. That was brutal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that or, well, I mean, here's another thing is if you get, um, you know, any one of these jet lighters, this one, of course, doesn't work. But if you have like a, a <laughs> accurate jet lighter, you know, these are eight bucks. You buy the fluid and, you know, the fluid, if you only are refilling that one lighter, is going to last you like a whole year. Like it's not going to. Too easy. Yeah, it's cheap and it works and you know it makes sense to me. So that's what I guess. <laughs> so Red Pop Packs, um, why the name? What does that stand for? And I'm pretty sure you've got a relatively important coworker that that makes up this the company. Luz, come here. Come. Come here, real quick. <laughs> Not gonna make a cameo. All right, well, yeah, so um I'll, I'll show her around. She's sleeping. That's her favorite thing to do. She's my, Lucy's my dog. Um, her, she, her trail name is Red Paw. Um, it wasn't my first backpacking trip, but among the first two or three, um, we went to this place called Providence Canyon in Georgia. And so I went yes. to school in Tallahassee, Florida, and that was our best backpacking spot, like anywhere nearby. Like, otherwise you're driving to, you know, the mountains, you're driving six to eight hours. So it was like, Okay, that's where we go. We do an annual trip every year. But on that first trip, um, Lucy was a puppy, one-year-old maybe, maybe under that even. I, I don't really recall. But you're basically walking through these canyons, which were created mm -hmm. from runoff like of agriculture that has just gone awry. Like they have mm -hmm. eroded the the soil, the clay, whatever, so much that they've created the mini Grand Canyon in the southeast. And Lucy is walking around on that trip and she's golden retriever. She's bright gold. She's got a white fluffy, you know, like highlights. Uh, she turned orange and red and she <laughs> stayed orange and red for two weeks. I don't know. I mean, it was a long time. It was long enough that my buddies and I were thinking about it. And then on the ride home from that trip, we're like, huh, red paw. 
that's a good idea. That, that'll that be your trail name, done. And it was literally no more thought than that. Like I wasn't using my own gear at that point. I wasn't thinking of starting a business, nothing like that. It was just like, oh, this would just be a cute nickname for the dog and, and that's it, you know? Um, so yeah, fast forward um, a year or two, then I'm, you know, still with all my same roommates. I'm in a different place, a house that's like slightly bigger. And I've got two industrial sewing machines in our living room. And thank God my, my buddies are good friends. They, they tolerated that and they were stoked about me starting a business. So those guys are my first customers, um, like literally ground, you know, customer one through three are my roommates. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was, uh, that's kind of how it started was just a nickname for the dog. And then I was like, well, if Lucy's going to go on every single hike that I go on, I'm going to start taking some photos. Maybe I'll start an Instagram page. And then I was like, huh, well, maybe I could use some stuff to walk the dog. Like I've, you know, if you're a dog owner, you know, this, you have all sorts of accoutrements, like mm -hmm. stuff in dog waste bags. You're putting a dog bowl, you're putting maybe treats. If you're training the dog, if you have a training collar, you have the little beeper. Um, I do all that stuff. I've got all that stuff. And it's like, where the heck do I put this? Because in Florida, you know, I'm running around in, in shorts. Like I'm in five inch inseam running shorts because it's so bloody hot. Like <laughs> there's no way you're wearing pants. So you don't have proper pockets. Heck, so I was like, yeah. okay, what's going to work? You know, what's going to hold all this stuff I need in it? And so then that created the flex fanny pack. That was the first idea. I was like, where does the dog stuff go? And so then I made the first one, took the dog in a walk, threw a water bottle on the top, which is like the defining feature is that stretchy top pocket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, there might be something here. Um, and and I just made an Instagram post. And I was like, okay, starting from zero followers, new, new account, obviously. Um, and then I get a message from this guy named Jonathan. He's like, hey, man, um, I'm going to through hike the AT and like, two months. How about you make me one of those packs and I'll pay you for it. And I was like, Whoa, first customer. <laughs> like, that's awesome. I didn't work for that. He reached out to me. Uh, anyway, you know, it's been a couple of years. Jonathan's my brand ambassador. Jonathan's through hike the AT and PCT with two different fanny packs. One was that first fanny pack made of light skin seven. The second one was a custom black five ounce Dyneema one I made for him to match his Palante pack. So now he's, now he's all kitted out with not exclusively my gear, but a lot of his gears <laughs> made for me. Um, in fact, he even came to my shop and made his own gear I saw at that. my shop recently. Yeah. So it's, it was cool that it was like, oh, my first sale practically, I think he's definitely in the first three, um, <laughs> you know, cause I was making one fanny pack a week. I was in college. I had a part-time <laughs> job. Like, you know, it was like my third thing. It wasn't even like, it's like my third job. Um, and so, yeah, it was like, it kind of fell in my lap that this might be a business idea from the yeah. first couple of people interested. And so, Are you yeah, surprised then... that when you started an Instagram and started posting these things that people like really caught on and love what you do? Of course. I mean, you have to, you know, how like that's in a weird, sick, twisted way, Instagram <laughs> is a validation, right? Because it's like, you know, if you start out as zero followers and you make a post and you get three likes, you're going to be like, okay, well, nobody even saw this. So nobody cares. Right. And it was like that for a very long time. Like, you know, your Instagram doesn't grow without the constant posting and all that other junk, which I hate social media, but of course I love my aspect of it, of interacting with people, <laughs> and like talking to my customers. And, you know, I like, actually do enjoy that. And I went to college for digital media. So I love taking photos and videos too, of course. Um, I don't even know where I was going with that. Could you repeat your question one more time? So I want to play off of the fanny pack there. So what does, sure. your, what does your product line look like now? So you started with the, the Flex Fanny Pack. I know you've got a couple of packs in your line, but what, what are they? Tell us what they, what, what, tell them what they are. Yeah, so it's, it's grown. Um, the first was the Flex Fanny Pack. Let's see, I've got a ton of stuff behind me. So the first thing was the Flex Fanny Pack, like I said before. Um, this one's in purple VX21. So this is the stretchy top pocket, um, number five waterproof zips. Then there's a phone pocket on the inside as well. That okay. was ground zero for products. Um, then after that, I don't think I have any with me, but the corner Fanny Pack, I believe was after that. I started with very small products because it was like, okay, 
it's going to be hard for me to make these period, let alone sell them. I have to start with small. And the corner is a really slim pack. It's like an inch and a half deep, about the same size as the flex, but it doesn't have that pocket on the top. Instead, it has a one corner, right top corner entry pocket. So you okay. basically can reach in there um, into the stretch pocket and put your phone or other little, my thing is the sunglasses. I have blue eyes and I always have to put the glasses away. Yes. Because if they're not on my eyes, they're on my head. And, and, if, like, you, and if they're not on I your eyes them. or on your head, then you can't see at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I just have, I'm just sunglasses. You know, I don't even, luckily I don't even have to do reading glasses. God knows what I do with that. But the sunglasses like go inside. Okay, put them here. Oh, put them back on. So I needed a place that I wasn't going to crush them and destroy them. And so that's how that one came to be. And with that pocket, um, then after that, I moved to Boulder and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to be full-time doing this business. I have to do bigger items. So then after that, I can kind of see it behind me. I developed yeah. a flat iron pack. Um, that's my first one. That's like covered in mud, like disgusting. Bag. <laughs> Still have it, of course, but that one I named after the flat irons, which is like our iconic Mount Ranger Boulder. Um, like when you search Boulder, Colorado, the only thing that comes up is like, it's the flat irons. Like it's a picture of that. It's like, look how beautiful it is. Like, come like, that's what they're trying to tell you with that photo. And so that's right in the front range is where I fell in love with Colorado and Boulder. So I was like, okay, well that's going to be the first bag. And not to mention the pockets are jagged and come to a point like this. <laughs> the flat irons are more of a shape like that, where it's a very sharp angle at the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I was like, okay, that closely resembles those pockets. And that's how that came to be. Um, and the other part of that is flat irons, in my opinion, it's a day hiking and climbing place. So you're not backpacking in the flat irons. What you're doing in the flat irons is you're going for a quick day trip. You're going for a snowshoe, you're doing something like that. So I added a 16 inch zipper right along the back. So while you're wearing the bag, you can reach in to the zipper, unzip it, reach into the bag, rezip it or flip it to your front and do the same thing. So I was like, what makes sense for a day bag? So then that's how that was developed. Um, and then after that, it was like, okay, well, people want backpacking bags. Like not everyone's gonna be able to fit in the 28 liters. Um, so then I went to, front, to the front range 40, which of course I'm sticking to the Colorado mountain theme. Um, <laughs> I don't know what the 60 liters gonna be. If anyone has any ideas, <laughs> tell me. But, <laughs> but then after that, um, here, let me move this. Then I went to a pretty typical three pocket design, um, you know, two water bottle pockets on the side, huge stretch pocket, um, just a bigger frameless bag. And now I offer them with frames too, which is kind of like an experimental thing. Um, but that's how it came to be is like what I wanted in a bag for each of these designs is how exactly how I made them. Um, you know, I wanted that quick day trip bag. I wanted that bag for backpacking in the Rockies. You know, I wanted the fanny pack for walking the dog, but I also wanted one I could use as a day bag only and throw the water bottle in. So for me, it's mostly been like, what's the problem? Okay, let's fix the problem with this solution um, and various little pockets and stuff make it exciting because that's, that's how, you, how I've come up with these designs and how they fix my issues. The, your big pack's got to be the Elbert, right? That's. Oh, I like that. Or the Mount Massive. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I didn't think about that one. <laughs> I, I did both of those this summer, and whew, they're both brutal. They're both hard, man. <laughs> both real tall. Um, so kind of going off of that in all of your packs, what do you think that Red Palm Packs is better than anyone else right now? I think right now it's customizability. Like, and I'll be the first to say, like, I have to select – judiciously what I'm like able to do. Like if someone comes to me and is like, Hey, like design a brand new bag from scratch, like I'll do it. I'll totally do it. But I have to charge you an arm and a leg for it because it's like one, you're not going to find anybody else in this marketplace. Who's willing to do that for you. Period. Like, like I just met up with someone who was local and made a bag for somebody. And it was like, yeah, I reached out to XYZ company and it uh, turns out they didn't do custom stuff. Well, it's like, yeah, of course they don't because it's incredibly time consuming. It, it, it costs people so much time and money to do mm -hmm. custom stuff. For me, I'm just like, that's kind of my jam. Like, that's what I like. So I'll do that until it's completely infeasible. Um, so, <laughs> so that's, I think, what makes us different. And 
better in our own way is that like I spend a lot of time on these bags. Like, and when you see me post a bag on Instagram and Facebook, like I post every bag that I make, like it, really, I don't make that many bags. Like I'm trying to get faster and, and to do that. And I have for sure over the last year, but you know, I literally every bag you see me post is the last bag I made. So it's, you know, I made maybe 20 to 30 this year. Um, it's not big numbers. It's not big numbers. Um, yeah. but no, but in terms of hours. Of <laughs> yeah, in terms of hours, you know, it took me the whole year. But, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think that's what's different is like, you're not getting something that's rolling off a production line from, a, you know, 100 employees for, you know, at least involved in the process of making it. It's like, no, no, no. Like, I did every bit of this from email exchanges over six months to, you know, one week or whatever that is to talking on the phone to saying, Oh, will this work? Will that work? Put a loop here. You know, it's like some people send me diagrams of like exact measurements of where they want stuff. And that's dope. Like I love when customers <laughs> do that because it makes it easy for me, but at the same time, it's always difficult. So like that kind of keeps my brain activated, um, which is important for me because like, that's why I started doing this in the first place was because it's like, it kept me engaged and it kept me motivated because it's like, Oh, well, everything is going to be a little different. Um, and, and so that gets me excited still. Uh, <laughs> What's your process like for like taking on a new order? Like if I were to come to you and say, Matt, I, I really want to like a fast pack, like something I can wear for like a long day, like running or just like something like that. What are, what sort of questions do you ask somebody? What's that process between getting from like an idea to a final pack made? Yeah. So it's usually starts like an Instagram DM and it's like, Hey, um, <laughs> I want this volume. I want these features. And I'm like, okay, well, will it work on the flat iron pack? <laughs> will it work on the 28 liter? Okay, great. Oh, it won't. Okay. Well, I can shorten it for you. I can do this and that. It's like, okay, well, I want these pockets. It's like, okay, well I can do these pockets. Will that work? And you kind of negotiate. I mean, it's almost like any friendship or relationship you have in life. It's like mm. you negotiate what you're willing to do, what you can do and what you absolutely cannot do. Like I absolutely <laughs> cannot spend 20 hours repatterning a bag for someone if I'm not going to be compensated for it. I mean, it's just bad business and frankly yeah, dumb. Yeah. Um, but like I said, if I can get that person to say, yeah, like let's base it on the flat iron or front range pack and do these tweaks to it. Like I'm super reasonable with the custom stuff because I, know that's the nature of my business right now. So like a lot of the time I'll charge very little for custom stuff. Um, and which is, it's surprising because a lot of other companies who aren't as custom as me are charging even more. Um, but I, I think that's, that's the process message, negotiate features, negotiate price, uh, determine feasibility. That's at least what I'm doing. Um, then from that point, if I have to make any new patterns, I will. I'll literally put pencil to paper and make it on my cardstock. Um, so then make the patterns. If it's sufficiently difficult and going to give me a headache, I'll have to do a prototype. Um, that's like, that's a rare thing. If I have to do a prototype, that's like a, I've never done this technique before. I have to learn the technique on the job mm -hmm. like right now. Um, so hopefully I skip that step most of the time. But then from that, it's just production. It's just, you know, using the patterns I have or have just made putting it, tracing on the fabric, cutting it out, and then sewing it on my four machines. Um, I've upgraded with to a lot of machines this year. Like I had just two, like pretty cheap guys. Um, now I've got four, um, two brand new ones this year. Like, and the automation has made things a lot faster. Um, like a Bartek machine, for example, that cuts the thread for you. The machine oh. I'm working on right now is, um, it's like, fully automated like the foot will lift up and down for you the thread is cutting um does back tacking like little things like that i've learned will save in that wow. actual production space time that's awesome that's it that's a huge step i remember when carter first showed me how to work on the industrial machine at work or at his house and it was brutal because the thing was lightning quick and my stitches were everywhere i could barely stay on it but now any <laughs> any time that i can honestly i will use the machine at carter's house just because you uh I mean, cutting a thread, even something like that, that saves you a couple seconds or like when you, you, you miss your thread snips, you end up cutting your fabric. It kind of makes yep. you want to jump off a balcony. So it makes it a little yep. easier. <laughs> oh, I, that's the thing is I have had that moment of just like, like frustration, like you don't know what to do. Like you're just angry. You're shaking. You're like, 
I'm so pissed that this didn't work. I still have that moment. Like that moment will never go away because as long as you're doing anything in this realm of MYOG or sewing, like that's the reality. Like you just have those moments, but having the right tools helps a lot. Of course. I, like, I love that. It's never, I love that because ultimately you don't really want to run from the, the difficult feeling, but become friends with that feeling. Right. So like, yeah, that's, that's the point. <laughs> yeah. It's like get used to it. And like, you mitigate your own response to it, if that makes sense. Like it's easy to get frustrated, but your response to the frustration is like 100% of it. It's like, oh, I just wasted all the fabric yeah. I cut out. I think oh, it goes like, back to- I start again. Yeah, I think it goes back to, to what you said about uh, like figuring out what's going on with your machine. Not only do you have to sew, but you have to like be one with your machine and you have to know like, is it the bobbin? Is it something else? Did I not? put the setting back right so for me when I'm sewing that's a lot of like reverse engineering and I'm just like you know what screw it. I'm just gonna like start all over take the thread out just redo everything so I think what you said makes a lot of sense and also like you just gotta talk nice to your sewing machine you know like yeah. words of affirmation like be really kind to it and then, then it look and then it worked <laughs> yeah well I mean it's a relationship you have to maintain you got to oil the machine you got to keep it dust free you know you got to make sure all the electrical works like especially with these like robot machines like I've got now like mm. you have to make sure that like nothing is breaking and and the funny thing is like I'm way too like hard-headed to go get my stuff repaired like I don't do that like I hate having to call somebody in who's gonna like make me feel small and like so I go oh, well you should have done this to fix your machine it's like no screw that whole situation like I won't do that I won't call a professional I open the machine myself and I get dirty with the oil and the screwdrivers because it's like one like save yourself the money and two when you do that you learn about the machine mm -hmm. that's probably the most valuable is like I know how to open every one of these machines, where to oil it. I can thread all of them, not with my eyes closed, but figuratively <laughs> speaking. Yeah, I yeah. can do that too. Like in my sleep, I could do this. Like um, not the sewing, but the threading, the basic stuff you do a million times a day. You know? So, so, so Matt's, like, saying, Matt's saying that red paw packs are sewed with his eyes closed right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish, man. I wish I could do this while I'm sleeping. It, it helped me get some more productive hours in during the day. But... <laughs> So, <laughs> so transitioning to the the final section with the holidays starting <laughs> or coming up depending on on where you end on that spectrum we've got some fun questions that uh hopefully just help us a little bit more about you and are just really goofy sure. so we've got a, a holiday would you rather um section so matt are you ready for this yep for everybody watching and listening, these are totally organic reactions. Matt, these these questions are kept confidential, so Matt doesn't know what he's going to ask and doesn't know what he's going to say yet either. So, uh, would you rather have to always eat cereal with eggnog, uh, or would you rather always eat cereal with eggnog or uh, instead of milk? Definitely not. I love milk. I could never, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't give up milk in the first place. I couldn't do it, but... Um... Eggnog, it's overrated in my opinion. Like it's, you know, you put a little bourbon in there, then then we're talking about something else. Um, but straight eggnog, not my favorite. I prefer regular milk. I still like it. I still drink it. Um, but yeah, I prefer whole milk over that. All right, you, you saved it with the you saved it with a spiked eggnog comment. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, would you rather have your tongue frozen to a light pole or take the wrong degree rated quilt for a camping trip? Well, I've never done the light pole thing. I have done the wrong quilt. Um, or no quilt. <laughs> and that too. Uh, shoot. I don't know. Do you get the tongue back if you put it on the pole? Like, I feel like at that point. It's just, with, just with less skin. Snip, snip. Like, you just cut it off. Like, you're, it's a lost cause. So, um, I'd probably go with the quilt. I feel like if I'm going to lose my taste forever, that would suck. Um, I could shiver all night, though. Like, I've done that a handful of times, so. Great, great answer. Would you rather live in a giant gingerbread house or ride on the Polar Express? <sighs> Polar Express. Yeah, that Polar Express. Yeah, I don't know about the gingerbread house. Like, that seems, we've been getting a lot of snow recently. I don't know how gingerbread fares in the weather, to be honest with you. I don't know how protected my machines will be with gumdrops and icing. So, probably Polar Express. 
Uh, would you rather have a nose that glows like Rudolph's or have pointy ears like an elf? Wow. Well, if I go for headphones, or I mean, if I go for ears, I can cover them with headphones. So maybe I'll go with that. Um, we already have big red noses in my family anyway, so I'll probably go for the ears. <laughs> And finally, for me, Avery's got her own set of questions, so don't get too comfortable. But final <laughs> question for me is, would you rather get socks for Christmas or get a co case of toilet paper? Let me just clarify. Would you rather get cotton socks for Christmas or one ply toilet paper? Because we all know wool socks are not a bad gift. Oh, that's, that's all I want for Christmas. Um, you know, I... Socks. It's got to be socks because here's the reason. Toilet paper not that valuable. Bidet is what I use in the back country and at home. Way better. Save the planet. Um, Hot take. Be cleaner. Yeah. Earlier this year, the one ply toilet paper was a commodity though. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, if we're talking trading value in the upcoming apocalypse or anything like that, that's a different story than definitely the toilet paper. I mean, the socks could be dual purpose though. <laughs> If you Washable, were like really either. in that bind and you needed toilet paper, use a sock. <laughs> Fair enough. That I haven't tried, but that probably would work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Sorry, not to get too off topic. Um, okay, so I have some questions. <laughs> what is one of your favorite winter outdoor activities? Clearly, you went from Florida to Colorado, so you've got lots more snow and probably more winter recreating options. Yeah, you know, I'd love to say it's skiing. Um, I'm crap at skiing. Like, I'm, I'm learning. I'm like, I'm a Florida boy. Like, I just started learning. Like, I don't know, at 23, like, you shouldn't just be learning how to ski. Um, you should have learned, like, at eight years old, like, with an instructor. <laughs> so, like, I injure myself. Like, last time I skied, I injured my thumb. I hit a tree and did a full front flip. Like, I was fine. Like, I just screwed my thumb up. Like, um, but my favorite activity is still hiking. Like, I got out and hiked slipped on some ice, you know, the other night, um, you know, there's extra fun in the winter it makes it a little extra difficult. And so like you get to throw the snowshoes on or the crampons, like I enjoy that a lot. Um, you know, I like skiing, so that's definitely second, but still just walking for me. That's still my favorite thing. Cool. I love it. What is your favorite holiday tradition? Favorite holiday tradition? Well, I don't know if it's necessarily a tradition, but we like to sneak in gag gifts for Christmas. Like, <laughs> like my, my dad is a very like stoic guy. Like he doesn't say very much. I don't know if that's the right word or not, but he, he doesn't talk very much. He's very conservative in what he says. Um, so my brother and my sister-in-law got my dad a Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer man thong for Christmas as a gag gift. And he laughed so hard that he choked last year. Like he was almost like suffocating for air. And it's like, that's a really rare thing in our family to really get my dad with a good belly laugh. So like, that's probably my favorite thing is gag gifts. I got one or two this year, so I can't spoil that for them. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's probably our favorite tradition. Although that's only maybe two, three years old. No, I love that. I think you can always start and build new traditions. It doesn't have to start when you were like six months old. So it's yeah. good to know that <laughs> that's a, that's a really good one. I'm going to have to think about what I can get my parents now to make them giggle and blush. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the thing is that's the goal. Like it can be a cheap thing. It can be like a $5 item, but if it's sufficiently embarrassing, it's priceless. Like that's, you know, that's the goal. <laughs> Yeah, now you can make a Dyneema man thong for this year. So it'll just be even better. <laughs> yeah, don't forget. That's a good idea. Don't forget the seasonal loincloths. Yeah, yeah. The uh, La Crevasse. Have you guys seen that YouTube video? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'll be next. 2021. Uh, we'll do the translucent 1.4 ounce Dyneema. So you really get a full picture of the package. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I don't know if I'll personally be able to male model that one. I probably, I won't although I do most of the photos in my Instagram. So maybe we'll make that just a product photo. Um, but 2021, expect it. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Sorry, I can't stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny because that's not the first time I've been told that. Like, Jonathan told me that the other day. Like, everyone's, everyone's like, man, the man thong. Because somebody made it on Reddit as a gag. Like, 
I don't know. Yeah. Go. yeah I think so. the Dyneema underwear, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, I know yeah, exactly what great. you're talking about. Yeah, it's a great idea. Um, you know. have, we do service companies that make apparel in that in that direct sense that have ripstop in them. So it's it's actually wow. there are there they are out there. Right on. <laughs> the more you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> moving on to the next question. Um, you're walking down the street feeling great. What holiday song is playing in the background? Wow. Um First one that comes to mind is Jingle Bells. That's just the first one like, I heard in my head. I like, just stopped like, for a moment. That's what it was. Like rock and roll Jingle Bells, or is it like Frank Sinatra Jingle Bells? Probably the Frank Sinatra version. I'm a big Frank Sinatra fan. Um, but that one in particular may be the rock and roll version, though. <laughs> nice. Um, finish this thought. It wouldn't be Christmas without blank. And thongs. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. At this point, uh, it wouldn't be Christmas without. This is a weird answer, but I'm going to say it. It's a prime rib roast. Almost every year for Christmas, we do a prime rib roast. Like we like, we love eating beef. Like we're Welsh. Like that's our thing apparently is dairy and beef. Like, I don't know. It's a superpower. I don't, I don't question it, but anyway, it's prime rib. And, um, that that in itself is kind of a Christmas tradition. So if we don't have that, I know something has gone wrong. Oh, that's a good answer. And you're making us hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you were trapped in a Christmas movie, which one would you want to be trapped in? Elf, I think. That's probably a pretty good one. Like that's a pretty good choice. Yeah, I mean, what what else are you gonna compare? Like, I'd love to hang out with Will Ferrell. Like, be a, I mean, I don't know if I want to be a Santa's elf. Like already pretty short like I don't know if I want to go much shorter um so probably would avoid that but that's generally a good little uh, universe to be in I think awesome that's all the Christmas holiday questions that I have thanks for making me giggle until my head hurt so <laughs> that was good <laughs> yeah of course <laughs> yeah Matt thanks for joining us I mean this I feel like I know you better. I follow you from my personal account, and obviously, every we see everything that you you tag us with with Rift Side by the Roll. So, I know you better, and and for everybody else watching, I hope that they can see you and now get a better idea of how your process for making Red Pop packs, for what you where how you've gotten here, and and what you do on a daily basis. So, um, yeah, thanks for joining us today. Of course, thank you guys for having me. Like, I'm really stoked you guys are doing this kind of podcast format. If that makes sense, like. Um, it's probably my first participation in any kind of podcast format. Like I'm used to being on camera or whatever from my very sparse like YouTube videos. Um, so, which I think that's like how a lot of people have kind of figured out, like, I'm just like a goof, like trying to do some sewing and, and make some fun gear, like just cause it's fun for me. Um, and that's kind of the ethos of what I'm trying to push out with Red Paws is like, it's like a weird uh, cross, like hybrid between like a personal brand and just like an outdoor brand where it's like, this is me, this is the dog, this is the gear I make. Like it's very transparent, if that makes sense. Like that's what I'm trying to, you know, just trying to be open and, and be real with people. Cause I feel like most of the time, like you, you find somebody, um, some company that you're getting a piece of gear from and it's like some nameless entity you don't care about you know, you couldn't care less about how it was made or who made it or if they're getting paid a living wage or whatever. And it's like, that's the opposite of what I'm trying to do. It's like, look at me, I'm making the bag for you. You're going to talk to me on the phone before we make the bag. Like I want it to be a human experience because that's what I want. You know, I want a human experience when I buy things. Um, and I like supporting humans that I know exist and, and are living, you know, doing what they like. So yeah, thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate it. Totally. Well, we're going to talk to you again soon, Matt. Uh, we'll have you on the podcast at one point in the future. You know, it, it's going to happen. We uh, Doors open, man. Let us know whenever you, you need something, reach out to Avery or I. And uh, for everybody else still watching, still listening, or laughing your heads off, whatever you're doing, go visit Red Pop Packs. Um, check them out. Check what they've got going on. And uh, yeah, we miss Lucy, but we'll, we'll find her another way. <laughs> Here, I got her. I got her. Don't worry. <laughs> Interrupt her nap. Yeah. Oh, what a sweet girl. <laughs> yeah. She's tired. She's work supervising, you know. She's got a lot of a lot of rest to catch up on. 
a lot of quality <laughs> quality control to look after. That's awesome. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you again so much. And um, I hopefully I think what a lot of what you said will resonate with everyone listening. And um, yeah, we're just so glad to talk to you and get to learn more about you. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you guys. Merry Christmas, Matt. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye.